My name is Angela Levy. I'm from Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. I'm going to discuss imaging diseases of the stomach. The goals of my talk are to review the imaging and anatomy of the stomach and to review the imaging features of non-neoplastic and neoplastic diseases of the stomach. Upper GI and CT are the primary imaging modalities of the stomach, complementary to endoscopy. The upper GI series can be performed as a single or double contrast study. Single contrast upper GI with water soluble contrast material is the preferred method to evaluate a patient with suspected perforation or postoperative leak. Thin barium is favored for other gastric pathologies such as hiatal hernia evaluation. The double contrast upper GI is a better evaluation of the gastric mucosa. It is a biphasic technique. The first phase is administering effervescent agent and thick barium to distend the stomach and coat the mucosa. This is followed by a single contrast exam. This slide shows two normal stomachs on double contrast upper GI. On the left, we see the normal mucosal pattern of the body and antrum of the stomach. It's characterized by a lacy-like network called the area gastrici. On the right, we see the normal rugal folds that run along the long axis of the stomach. The normal thickness of the rugal folds varies with the degree of distension of the stomach. To visualize the fundus, the patient should stand upright, the image on the left, or be turned into the right lateral position, the image in the right. In the right lateral position, you can see a smooth oval rosette surrounding the GE junction, and this is the gastric cardia. Gastric distension is required for evaluation of the stomach on CT. This can be achieved with positive, neutral, or negative contrast material. In all cases, IV contrast material is preferred to visualize gastric wall enhancement. On these images, we, show, we see the normal stomach with positive contrast material on the left and neutral contrast material on the right. Neutral contrast material is preferred because with neutral contrast material, we can clearly see the normal enhancing gastric wall with neutral contrast in the gastric lumen. On the left, the fully distended stomach, the gastric wall becomes imperceptible because it enhances similarly to the positive contrast material in the gastric lumen. The normal thickness of the gastric wall ranges from 5 to 10 millimeters depending upon the location of the stomach. The thickest portion of the stomach is the gastric antrum, which can go up can go up to 10 millimeters in thickness. The normal gastric antrum is depicted on the lower left image in positive contrast within the lumen, and on the lower right image with neutral contrast in the lumen. The other area of pseudo-thickening that can be seen is at the GE junction. The upper left image shows a normal GE junction and the so-called pseudo-thickening of the GE junction, which is due to the oblique orientation of the GE junction with respect to the axial imaging plane. The fat surrounding the stomach is composed of the perigastric fat and the supporting ligaments of the stomach. The fat between the stomach and the liver is a lesser omentum, also called the gastrohepatic ligament. The fat anterior to the stomach is the greater omentum, and the fat between the stomach and the spleen is the gastrosplenic ligament, which is a continuation of the greater omentum. We'll turn our attention to non-neoplastic diseases of the stomach, peptic ulcer disease, hiatal hernia, and volvulus. Peptic ulcers are common, occurring in about 10% of adults in Western population. These are benign ulcers that occur more commonly in the duodenum than in the stomach. They are multifocal in up to 30% of patients. The two most common causes are H. pylori infection and NSAID therapy. Other etiologies include steroids, tobacco, alcohol, coffee, bile reflux, gastric stasis, and stress. Patients complain of symptoms such as epigastric pain, right upper quadrant pain, pain radiated into the back. They may experience a burning sensation in the epigastrum, belching, nausea, and or vomiting. Perforation, obstruction, and bleeding are symptoms that are related to complications from peptic ulcers.
On imaging, they are focal outpouchings or ulcer craters that extend beyond the normal gastric mucosa. On the left-hand image on an upper GI, we see an ulcer crater extending beyond the mucosa of the stomach. On the CT study on the right, we see a similar finding. This ulcer crater contains air and fluid and extends beyond the normal gastric mucosa. Surrounding it is low attenuation edema in the gastric wall that extends into the gastrohepatic ligament. The main differential diagnosis for peptic ulcers is a malignant ulcer, which is an ulcer in a mass. The left-hand image shows mass effect from a large gastric carcinoma along the lesser curvature of the stomach, and within that mass there is an ulcer crater. On CT, we can directly visualize the mass as a soft tissue mass in the gastric wall. Centrally on this examination, you can see a divot that represents the ulcer crater. The other differential diagnosis is a gastric diverticulum. This typically occurs in the posterior gastric fundus of the or the cardia of the stomach, and it is a smoothly marginated saccular outpouching. Hiatal hernias are quite common as well, occurring in about 10% of the population. Their incidence increases with age, and it represents migration of the stomach through the esophageal hiatus. There are three types sliding, parasophageal, and mixed. The main differential diagnosis is a diaphragmatic hernia. A diaphragmatic hernia is when the stomach protrudes through a rent of the hemidiaph in the hemidiaphragm. These are located lateral to the esophageal hiatus. This slide depicts the three types of hiatal hernia. Sliding hernia on the left by upper GI, the GE junction is above the diaphragm and the stomach slides along with the elevation of the GE, GE junction. The parasophageal depicted by CT in the middle where the GE junction is normal position and a portion of the stomach herniates alongside the distal esophagus. The mixed type is a combination of sliding and parasophageal. The GE junction is higher than the diaphragm. There is a portion of the stomach that not only herniates through the hiatus along with the elevated GE junction, but also alongside the distal esophagus. Volvulus is rotation of the stomach. The predisposing factors are abnormal gastric anatomy. Most patients with gastric volvulus have a hiatal hernia. Volvulus can be asymptomatic if there is no obstruction or vascular compromise, or some patients present with chronic vague pain and vomiting. If there is complete obstruction, patients may present with Borchardt's triad, which is severe epigastric pain, retching without producing vomitus, and the inability to pass a nasogastric tube into the stomach. There are two types of gastric volvulus. Organoaxial, which is the most common, pictured on the left, in which there is rotation about a long axis of the stomach. The long axis is the axis that extends from the GE junction to the pylorus. When rotation occurs, the greater curvature is displaced superior to the lesser curvature. The mesenteroaxial volvulus is rotation about the short axis of the stomach, which is an imaginary line that connects the lesser curvature with the greater curvature. When rotation occurs about this axis, the rotation is generally to the, from right to left, such there is a twist in the body of the stomach. In this example, we can see the twist in the mid-portion of the stomach and the rotation of the uh, antrum by volvulus into a large hiatal hernia. We'll now turn our attention to neoplastic diseases of the stomach. We'll discuss benign and malignant tumors of the stomach. Gastric polyps are the most common benign tumors of the stomach. Of all gastric polyps, hyperplastic polyps are the most common. They are also referred to as inflammatory or regenerative polyps. These are not neoplastic polyps. Most are less than one centimeter in size and discovered incidentally when the patient is being imaged for another reason. Adenomatous polyps are less common. They're usually larger than a gastric polyp. They have the potential to transform into adenocarcinoma. And most patients are symptomatic with 
pain, bloating, upper GI bleeding. And if these occur in the antrum, they can prolapse into the duodenum. On imaging, a polyp is a small protrusion into the lumen of the stomach. On upper GI, with air contrast, it will be coated in barium. On a single contrast upper GI, the polyp will displace the barium pool, producing a filling defect in the stomach. On CT, it is a small nodular projection into the gastric lumen. The differential diagnosis includes fundic gland polyps, which are a variant of hyperplastic polyp. They are usually multiple. Lipoma. On CT, we should see a lipoma as fat attenuation, and if seen on upper GI, it may change position or shape. Gastrointestinal stromal tumor, or GIST and a polypoid gastric adenocarcinoma. These are usually larger and more irregular with lobulated or ulcerated margins. Adenocarcinoma is the most common gastric malignancy representing 95% of all gastric malignancies. The main etiology is thought to be chronic H. pylori infection. Patients with atrophic gastritis, pernicious anemia, adenomatous polyps, partial gastrectomy, and hereditary syndromes that include gastric carcinoma have an increased incidence. They are more common in men than women with a peak age between 50 and 70 years. Patients present with clinical symptoms of weight loss, pain, bloating, early satiety, nausea, vomiting, and or gastrointestinal bleeding. Early gastric carcinomas, those that are small in size, are areas of thickening or ulceration on the gastric mucosa. Many of them hyper-enhanced during the arterial phase of contrast enhancement. The example on your right, at the GE junction, a small focal thickening of the mucosa that is hyper-enhancing, and this was a gastric adenocarcinoma. The image on the left does not has a, have as much enhancement as the example on the right, but indeed there is enhancing thickening of the mucosa at the level of the pylorus for this patient's adenocarcinoma. For larger adenocarcinomas, there are four basic patterns. The large polypoid or fungating mass depicted on this coronal CT as an irregular mass with irregular margins and heterogeneous CT attenuation. The mass in which the majority of the mass is ulcerated, such that there is only a thin rim of soft tissue surrounding it. This is the so-called ulcerating or excavating adenocarcinoma. It is more common on the lesser curvature of the stomach. In this example, we can see thickening of the lesser curvature of the stomach. And in the middle of that thickening, we see a large ulcer crater. These can be very difficult to detect on CT if the stomach is not well distended. The ulcerating and infiltrating form in which there is an infiltrating component that thickens the gastric wall. Mask continues to have an ulceration along the luminal surface. And then the infiltrating form that either focally or diffusely infiltrates the gastric wall, thickening the gastric wall and replacing the normal rugal fold pattern. These can have normal gastric distension associated with them or they may narrow the stomach due to the fibrotic reaction that occurs as the tumor infiltrates, producing linitis plastica. This is a nice example of linitis plastica with narrowing of the gastric lumen, thickening of the gastric wall, and loss of the normal rugal fold pattern. In addition, you see small perigastric nodes in the perigastric fat accompanying this tumor. Once we identify the tumor on CT, the goal of CT is to stage the tumor. Gastric carcinoma infiltrates and spreads directly into adjacent structures, which includes the lesser and greater omentum. In this example, we can see tumor extension by linear strands and nodules into the greater omentum on the axial image on the left and on the coronal image on the right. The tumor may also spread to the peritoneal cavity. In this patient, we see circumferential wall thickening of the antrum, abnormal enhancement and thickening of the antral wall, and then a little lower in the abdomen, a small nodule in the omentum, 
that represents peritoneal metastasis. Peritoneal metastasis may implant on the ovaries. These are called Krukenberg metastasis. And in this patient, we see large bilateral ovarian masses. The image on the right, thickening of the gastric wall, and a liver metastasis for this patient with gastric adenocarcinoma, peritoneal metastasis, and liver metastasis. Gastrointestinal stromal tumors are the most common mesenchymal neoplasm of the GI tract. These can be malign or malignant. They arise from the interstitial cell of Cajal, which is located in the muscularis propria. They do occur anywhere in the GI tract, but they are most common in the stomach. The stomach represents the site of 50 to 70 percent of all GIST. The small bowel is the second most common site, followed by the anorectum. They are very rare in the colon and the esophagus, and occasionally they can occur extra-intestinal with no apparent connection to the GI tract. They account for about 2-3% to of all gastric tumors, and GIST may be benign or malignant. The biologic behavior of GIST may be difficult to predict at time. The size of the tumor the location of the tumor, that is the organ it originates in, and the number of mitoses per high power field are the best predictors of malignancy. Just have no race or gender predilection. They occur in all ages. The mean age of presentation is 50 to 70 years. The patient's symptoms depend upon the size and location of the tumor. For gastric gist, they are often incidentally discovered when they are small and benign. When they are larger, they can cause epigastric pain, gastrointestinal bleeding, and anemia. Differential diagnosis includes other lesions that occur in the submucosal or subepithelial spaces in the stomach wall. Lipoma, which will be fat attenuation on CT. Ectopic pancreas, if the lesion is located near the pylorus along the greater curvature. Duplication cyst, if the lesion contains fluid. Lymphoma, which tends to be a very homogeneously enhancing mass and often has regional adenopathy. Metastatic disease and rarely other mesenchymal tumors, neurofibroma and schwannoma. Because GIST arise from the muscularis propria, it can grow toward the gastric lumen or away from the gastric lumen. So there are three basic patterns depicted on this image and with these illustrations. The submucosal nodule that we see on the bottom left CT, the lesion that straddles the lumen and the exophytic compartment of the perigastric fat, um, depicted on the CT below. This has a portion in the stomach and a portion outside of the stomach. And the gist that is predominantly exophytic, depicted on the CT on the bottom right, where the majority of the mass is outside of the stomach. Note in these, however, the gastric wall will always have an area of small focal thickening, indicating that that is indeed the origin of the tumor. GIST can attain very large sizes, particularly when they are highly malignant. The larger a GIST gets, the more tendency it has to have degeneration and hemorrhage within it, such that it can be very heterogeneous in CT attenuation. So here we have three different patients. The patient on the upper left, exophytic gist with degeneration and hemorrhage. Patient on the upper right, majority of the tumor has degenerated. There is a thick surrounding wall. And the patient on the bottom where the tumor is predominantly solid and there's calcification within the gist. It's important to remember that gist can calcify. There is no specific pattern of calcification. It can be coarse, stippled, or punctate. In all cases, however, we see a very direct connection to the stomach, indicating that the stomach is the origin of these tumors. In addition, we see that the outer margin of the gist is well circumscribed, and that is typical of gist without peritoneal metastasis. The two sites that gist most commonly metastasize to when they are malignant are the liver and the peritoneal cavity. Liver mets look like ordinary liver mets, hypotenuating lesions within the liver. Peritoneal mets and gist look like ordinary peritoneal mets, nodules and masses in the peritoneal cavity. One exception, however, 
the metastatic disease of GIST tends not to have abundant ascites in contrast to that of adenocarcinoma with, in which societies is often a predominant feature of their peritoneal metastatic disease. GIST can also have distant mets to the lung, to the bone, to the brain when there is widespread disease. And very importantly, lymph node metastasis are very rare in GIST. Gastric lymphoma represents 3 to 5 percent of gastric malignancies. It can be primary to the stomach or part of widespread lymphoma. The stomach is the most common site of lymphoma in the GI tract. Primary gastric lymphoma is thought to be secondary to chronic H. pylori infection, which gives rise to mucosal associated or low grade malt lymphoma, which subsequently can give rise to diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Other patients at increased risk for gastric lymphoma include immunosuppressed organ transplant recipients, patients with celiac disease, and patients with HIV infection. Gastric lymphoma is more common in men than women with a mean age of 50 to 60 years. Patients present with symptoms of pain, nausea, vomiting, upper GI bleeding, and weight loss. Advanced lymphoma tends to be a very large, bulky mass. In distinction and comparison to other GI tumors, lymphoma tends to be very homogeneous in CT attenuation. You can also see small polypoid or nodular masses in the stomach. Rarely lymphoma can diffusely infiltrate and produce a linitis plastic pattern similar to adenocarcinoma. In this example on the bottom right, we see a bulky mass, very homogeneous CT attenuation, and large adenopathy in the gastrohepatic ligament. Differential diagnosis includes adenocarcinoma, which tends to be less bulky and tends to have smaller regional nodes. Malignant GIST, which tends to be more heterogeneous in CT, is usually more rounder and is not associated with adenopathy. Hypertrophic gastropathies, such as Menetriase disease, these tend to spare the rugal fold pattern, and specifically for menetriase disease, spare the antrum. They may have features that are associated with other problems of their disease, such as ascites and anasarca and menetriase disease due to the associated hypoproteinemia. And then gastritis, such as H. pylori gastritis. Now these don't produce marked thickening of the gastric wall, but more mild thickening. So you may have a lower grade lymphoma in mind when you see very mild thickening and you're thinking of gastritis in the differential diagnosis. Finally, gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors. These are tumors that arise from endocrine cells in the mucosa and submucosa. The term carcinoid is applied to them when the tumor is well differentiated. They have variable biologic behavior and there are three basic types that occur in the stomach. The type 1 gastric carcinoid is the most common. It is the consequence of hypergastrinemia from chronic atrophic gastritis or pernicious anemia. These patients have multifocal small tumors with an indolent biologic behavior. Neuroendocrine tumors tend to enhance avidly in the arterial phase of contrast enhancement, such that when they are suspected, doing an arterial phase exam will facilitate their visualization. In this type 1 gastric carcinoid, you can see multiple small nodules as well as slightly larger nodules throughout the stomach. The type 2 gastric carcinoid is associated with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome and or MEN1 syndrome. This is the least, type, least common type of gastric carcinoid. These are multifocal carcinoids in the background of hyperplasia of the gastric mucosa that comes from the underlying Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So finding these gastric carcinoids is best done in the arterial phase of contrast enhancement where we can see on the left-hand image small enhancing nodules in the background of a hypertrophic gastric wall. When we move to the portal venous phase on the right, these become imperceptible in this very thickened gastric wall.
The last type is the type 3 gastric carcinoid, which is the second most common. These are sporadically occurring carcinoids. They are generally solitary and they have very aggressive malignant behavior. In this example, arterial phase image showing an enhancing mass in the posterior stomach and this patient also has liver and spleen metastasis. In summary, we've discussed imaging techniques, upper GI and CT of the stomach that are complementary to endoscopy, review the neoplastic and non-neoplastic diseases that occur in the stomach. Thank you very much for your attention.